Hello, I'm Jan Newharth, Chair and Chief Executive Officer of the Freedom Forum. Welcome to First Five Now, a Freedom Forum conversation series that explores topical issues and features current newsmakers who are using the five freedoms of the First Amendment to guide their work. Today, CBS News Chief White House Correspondent Nancy Cordes assesses the first 100 days of the Biden administration, and in particular, his relationship with those who cover him in the press. This program is brought to you by the Freedom Forum, which fosters First Amendment freedoms for all. Our vision is an America where everyone knows, understands, values, and defends the freedoms of religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. And now, please welcome our moderator, John Maynard. Thank you, Jan, and welcome to First Five Now. I'm John Maynard, Senior Director of Programs for the Freedom Forum. Last week, President Joe Biden marked his 100th day in office with an address to a joint session of Congress. The look and feel of this year's address was certainly atypical, with the limited audience in the House chamber, masked up and socially distanced. But less atypical was the sight of a U.S. president using the opportunity in addressing a nationwide audience to tout his accomplishments. Over the course of his 65-minute speech, Biden spoke of new investments and tax reforms to overhaul the economy, job creation for the middle class, the coronavirus response, and efforts to address systematic racism. Today, we'll assess President Biden's first 100 days and some of these issues, but also dive deep into his relationship with members of the press during that period, and how it stands in contrast with Biden's predecessor. We are so pleased to be joined by Nancy Cordes, who was named CBS News' Chief White House Correspondent in January. Nancy was previously CBS News' Chief Congressional Correspondent, where, among many other stories, she led coverage of rioters storming the U.S. Capitol in January, as well as both of President Trump's impeachments. She joined CBS in 2007 and has been a major contributor to CBS News' election coverage since 2008. Nancy Cordes, welcome to First Five Now. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so we're going to talk about President Biden's first 100 days in office, but uh, you too recently marked your first 100 days as a, as a White House correspondent, chief White House correspondent for CBS News. Tell us, how, the, how is the new gig? Uh, it's fantastic. I uh, highly recommend trying something new every decade or so. Uh, helps to keep the juices pumping. i had been covering Congress for about 12 years and loved that beat. Uh, I think in many ways it is the best beat in Washington. You have such incredible access to the people you cover. Uh, you know, I learn something new every day. Uh, but the White House is an entirely different beast. And um, I've had such a great time getting to know my new White House unit at CBS News. We have a really robust team, uh, very hardworking, very collaborative. So that's been great. And it's been nice to be um, covering the White House at the very start of a new administration. So while they're getting the hang of it, I am too. Um, and of course, it's a little difficult to get to know the people that I'm covering right now, those that I don't know already, because uh, it's still uh, tough to meet in person. And they're uh, extremely cautious at this White House, even about meeting with one another, let alone meeting with us. Um, but uh, but nevertheless, uh, there are some opportunities. I've uh, been on a few domestic trips already with the vice president, with the president, and been able to talk a little bit with them and certainly a lot more with their aides. And, um, and I'm really loving it so far. All right. Tell us sort of, I know it's only been 100 days for you two, uh, covering a little over 100 days covering the White House, but what's, what, are you, what would you consider the major difference in covering the White House as opposed to covering uh, Capitol Hill? Uh, well, first of all, I get far fewer steps. <laughs> um, on Capitol Hill, I'm kind of on the run quite a bit. If I'm not sitting in a hearing that's lasting all day, um, I'm running from press conference to a, a stakeout trying to pigeonhole some lawmaker and ask them a question uh, to the Senate floor for votes. And, um, you know, you really you really wear wear your shoes down, uh, trekking back and forth to various congressional office buildings and the U.S. Capitol. At the White House, we're very constrained. 
Um, I get a few hundred steps a day. You've seen it. I mean, the press room is smaller than it looks on TV. Our our little um, booths are, are very tiny and they're right next to it. There are very few places that we are allowed to go on the White House complex. And I tend not to leave the White House grounds when I'm once I'm there, because if the president were to make an announcement or suddenly come into the briefing room, you would not want to be uh, off hanging out at Starbucks or Sweet Green or something like that. You want to be at the White House. And so uh, that's been a, a one big change is that, um, you know, it used to be that if, if I had a question for a particular lawmaker, I could just kind of figure out where they were and go there. Um, now I'm working phones a lot more and um, walking to and from work in order to get the steps. There you go. So you're keeping your Fitbit busy still. So that's good. <laughs> yeah. um, I'd, I'd also like to get your thoughts on the fact that women are leading White House coverage on all the major networks. How, how, how does that make you feel? Uh, I love it, uh, primarily because they are all really great friends of mine, and I have uh, been an admirer of theirs for far longer than that. And so I feel really privileged to be uh, sitting alongside them, working alongside them every day. But um, you know, we are all kind of veteran. We've been in the same foxhole many a time together on campaigns, um, covering the Hill in some cases. And so being reunited with Chris Welker and Cecilia Vega um, is, is tremendous. Um, getting to know Caitlin Collins and Yamish, uh, it's just, it's, um, it's, really, it's really fantastic. And I just sort of have to pinch myself all the time that, um, that I get to go to work and see them. The ironic thing is that you would think, given how tiny our quarters are and how, you know, I'm separated by nothing but a a few feet from, from Cecilia and Kristen and the rest of them. It's, um, it's so busy on a daily basis between the daily briefing and various presidential events and live shots and um, COVID briefings three times a week and any interviews that we're doing for our own stories and writing that we don't really get nearly as much time to just hang out and talk as you would imagine. And there are often day, entire days that go by and I kind of resurface at the end of the day and I realize, oh, you know, I, I didn't have any chance to really connect with them at all. So um, it, it is a sort of a constant churn at the White House, even on days that you would consider slow days without a ton of news. Sometimes in those cases, you actually find yourself working harder to, to you know, to dig and come up with something. Right. So it's, it's still early, um, but I did want to get your assessment uh, on the relationship between the administration and, and the members of the press and your colleagues that you just mentioned. Um, how would you describe it at, at this point? Well, I think, first of all, there is a, a great deal of familiarity because many, certainly not all, but many of the people working in this White House, um, a lot of us have been covering them for a long time. They are veterans of the Obama administration, some of them even veterans of the Clinton administration, or they've worked on Capitol Hill. um, And those of us who covered the Hill have uh, known them in that setting as well. Certainly there are reporters who covered President Biden when he was Senator Biden uh, on Capitol Hill. And he has a team around him that's quite loyal and has been with him for a long time, even dating back to his his Senate days. So in that sense, I think that... um, you know, these are people who slipped into their roles fairly seamlessly, uh, had a high comfort level because they had been there before and they had some some muscle memory. On the other hand, we were in an unprecedented situation where um, the the press couldn't operate the way that it normally would. Um, for example, we still had to have a great deal of spacing between every reporter in the White House briefing room at every briefing. And so while uh, it was great that briefings came back on a daily basis. You couldn't have nearly as many reporters in that briefing room as you normally would. And um, even the major networks couldn't be in there on a daily basis. We sort of had to swap out and have a rotation. Um, and so, you know, that that created some some challenges and, and it was a little bit of trial and error. Um, and like any administration, it kind of took them a little time to get up to full staffing. So there would sometimes be confusion about who you were supposed to, you know, they were trying to do a lot 
in the early days, but not always with a full contingent of aides who could uh, be on hand to answer every question. Sometimes you didn't know who to go to, but I think a lot of that is is to be expected. Um, I think that the um, one of the the hallmarks of this administration in its early days is that it it they obviously came in wanting to show that they were uh, the opposite of the Trump administration in every way, and so they were incredibly organized. They had a plan and stuck to it. Um, they were quite tight-lipped, uh, which can be frustrating for, for reporters. And, um, you know, they would, they would have a strategy and they would execute on it. And um, I think it was a, a sort of whiplash for a lot of rep- reporters who had covered the previous administration who had unbelievable access to uh, all of President Trump's senior advisors and could really pick up the phone any hour of the day and, and get a, a really senior official at the White House on the phone who would tell you a lot of things. Now, all of those things wouldn't necessarily be correct. Um, and they might be true when you heard them, but turned out not to be true an hour later when the president changed his mind. But you did have uh, a great deal of access. And and that's that's different with the Biden administration. Um, and uh, especially in the early days where, you know, they're really trying to show that they can, um, you know, they can have a plan and they can stick to it, um, almost trying to 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 make the claim that um, that there's there's a, a complete 180 from the Trump administration to this administration. And where that becomes a little challenging is when there is a problem that crops up, and it is an obvious problem. It is a challenge. One might say a crisis, for example, a crisis at the border. I think initially there was sometimes a reluctance to acknowledge those challenges or those crises, a few of them, because it ran counter to the narrative that the Biden administration was trying to lay out there, that they were the problem solvers, not problem creators. Mm-hmm. Speaking, you know, speaking of access, um, do you think, you know, how much a role has, has the, the, vi- the virus and the, the social distancing and not being able to be next to each other at n- not just press conferences, but, you know, dinners and things like that? How much a role do you mm-hmm. think that's played? And I know it's hard to predict this, but once we're back to normal, which could be soon, um, yep. will, will that, that access, you know, do you think will, there might be more? I, did, or, I know it's hard to say, but just some I think thoughts. there will, yes. I think there will, because, you know, yeah. We've, I've had Zoom meetings with various administration officials, um, but obviously you're not going to be able to, you know, when you're having your, it's one thing if you know someone and you have, and you Zoom with them or have a call with them. If you're meeting them for the first time on Zoom, it's really hard to kind of develop um, any kind of relationship on right. Zoom if that's your first interaction. And so, yes, it is, it is challenging to, to build that rapport in in that environment. Um, uh, on the other hand, you know, they, they are in the same boat. And so, you know, I do find, I've actually been surprised at how often I am able to get someone on the phone. They're pretty good about the phone. Uh, I find, um, you know, especially if you've got a, a quick, a quick question that you need answered. Um, and I think, you know, they are, some of them are eager to, to connect as well. So hopefully, you know, as the, as we get into the summer, we'll have more of an opportunity to sit down face to face with various officials and actually connect on that basis. Um, A lot was written about how um, uh, President Biden waited uh, 65 days until his first press conference. Um, And I read every president since Calvin, Calvin Coolidge had given a news conference by a comparable point in, in his term. First of all, how valuable are those news conferences? Um, and uh, do you think he's going to continue just doing them very in, you know, infrequently? Or, or do you think that'll, that might step up also? So I don't know if he'll, con- if he'll continue to have press conferences like that very yeah. frequently. But what he does tend to do a lot, what he seems more comfortable with, is... Um, uh, doing an event and then taking several questions from reporters afterwards. Uh, that's what happened when I traveled with him last week. We went down to um, 
Atlanta. He went and visited the Carters and um, then he held an event. Uh, he held a car rally. And then when he uh, got back to Air Force One to fly home, he stopped and took about 10 questions from the small group of pool reporters who were there traveling with him, which I think was a surprise to many of us. We thought maybe he would come and answer one or two questions, but he actually took a bunch. Um, and then uh, on the day that, that we're taping this, John, he just gave a speech about um, uh, about vaccine hesitancy. And that's usually an environment where we anticipate that he won't take questions because it's kind of a formal speech at the White House. Uh, and yet he took about five questions from reporters, serious detailed questions at the tail end of that speech. So I, you know, I'm, I'm starting to get the sense that the White House views those opportunities as you know, a little bit less of a high wire act, uh, an opportunity to engage with reporters and answer serious questions without kind of um, giving all of us the, um, the time and, and the, the runway to you know, come up with stump the president type of type of questions. Um, obviously, like any reporter, I'm a fan of more press conferences rather than fewer. Um, but I, you know, I have had a number of opportunities in various settings to um, to ask him questions, uh, and I'd say it, you know it's a bit a uh, bit more than I had anticipated. Although you know, obviously, for anyone who was covering the Trump administration, it you know it's it's there's no comparison because every time President Trump walked out to Marine One um, uh, or whenever he felt like popping into the briefing room. He uh, took a lot of questions from reporters on a, a weekly basis. Right. And, um, you know, the news cycle certainly has changed since uh, with the Trump administration because because of Twitter. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. And I know you weren't covering President Trump, you know, as a White House correspondent, but you were you were still there in, right. in Congress. So, yeah, tell us a little sure. bit about how the, the news cycle has has changed. <laughs> Well, you know, I think while I didn't cover the White House, I mean, every day on Capitol Hill was kind of a whirlwind of reacting to whatever the president had said on Twitter. And so often I would find more, my stories changing four times a day because the president would make some new pronouncement and Congress would be uh, in an uproar and we'd be chasing lawmakers around to ask them what they think about this or what does this mean? Um and so there was a lot of churn, um, you know, not all of it was incredibly rewarding because it was ephemeral. You know, you would make a pronouncement, you'd have to cover it because um, it was the president of the United States, but he might very well change his position later that afternoon or evening when he heard from someone else who had a different opinion. So um, from that sense, as someone who got into journalism to cover policy issues, it could be a little, um, little frustrating. So um, it, is, it is nice that we are now um, covering serious policy debates again over issues like infrastructure and spending and taxes. It obviously requires more research. It uh, takes more time. Um, it can be harder to make that sexy. Um, you know, and, and, and to put it into terms that, um, that both make it understandable for people and also help them understand why they should care and why it, it um, relates to them and their lives. But it's more important and it's more lasting. And, um, and it, it does have a huge influence on, um, on people and their bank accounts and their livelihoods. Um, and so, you know, it's the kind of thing that um, that I think is, you know, the reason that a lot of us got into journalism in the first place. Uh, this is a very broad question, but um, I wanted to ask you what you thought some of the administration's biggest accomplishments have been in, in this short 100 day, 100 plus day period, as well as setbacks, um, if any, on, on both questions, setback, uh, you know, accomplishments and setbacks. Sure. Um, so obviously, you'd have to say the the. American Rescue Plan, the the rescue the bill, COVID bill uh, is far and away their biggest first accomplishment. Although I'd, I'd pair that with uh, creating a a smooth and expanding rollout of 
the vaccine, ensuring that it was available at 40,000 uh, pharmacies across the country and um, working with states to establish mass vaccination sites um, and creating a system whereby um, in fairly short order states knew how much vaccine they were getting on a weekly basis so they could um, uh, make a plan to disseminate it to the public. Um, sounds kind of basic now, but that didn't really exist when the Biden team came into office. And, you know, that's kind of the whole ball game right now is, is getting people vaccinated. And I think the big test um, going forward in the next few months is going to be whether they can um, execute on plan B, which is convincing, finding ways to incentivize and convince people who haven't gotten vaccinated to do so and how you get the vaccine to them to make it easier for them um, to, to get the shot. Um, because uh, as we all know, the only way to vanquish this virus is to make sure that you know 80% or more of the population is, is vaccinated. Um, biggest setback, uh, obviously one of the early setbacks was the surge of migrant children at the border. Um, you know, this team came in determined to change the rules, to go back to um, uh, what other presidents had done when it came to unaccompanied migrant children and allow them into the country and house them and make sure that they had basic services uh, rather than send them back across the border to Mexico. The only problem is that they, um, they executed very early on this plan um, but didn't seem prepared for the inevitable surge of children who would arrive, all of this pent up demand after uh, four years of a very different administration. And so uh, they really had to scramble to set up facilities that would be able to house these children in a safe and humane way, uh, which was made even more difficult by the fact that you had social distancing requirements, which meant you couldn't house as many children in a single facility as you might've been able to in the past. So they seem to be caught somewhat flat footed by what um, probably a lot of immigration experts could have told them was uh, likely to be an inevitable outcome of um, changing the policy and announcing that, that uh, unaccompanied children would have uh, at least temporary safe harbor here in the United States. Um, so I think that that was uh, an early, uh, early lesson, but um, one that they seem determined to try to turn into a positive, at least for uh, the vice president, as they look to uh, kind of boost her portfolio by putting her in charge of a really intractable problem, which is um, the, the pipeline of, of migrants from the Northern Triangle countries in Central America to the United States and trying to deal with some of the problems in their home countries that lead them to come here in the first place. Right. I was hoping you could put on your congressional correspondent hat on for just a moment again and mm -hmm. uh, look ahead. Uh, we always like to do that, you know, look to the next election, <laughs> even though we just got over right. But the, the 2022 yeah. midterms obviously are looming. Um, and uh, with the census coming out and then, you know, the Democrats are going to be losing a couple of seats already. So how does that, how do you see the midterms shaping up and how does that potentially affect the Biden, Biden agenda? Well, history, if history is any guide, um, the first midterm after a presidential election is never good for the, the party that holds the White House. And so uh, obviously that would be terrible news for this White House because uh, they only ha have just the slimmest of majorities in the House right now. They really can't afford to lose any seats. Another big challenge for Democrats beyond that is uh, there have been so many Republicans who have retired over the past few cycles um, because it's really no fun being in the minority. Um, and some of them chose to leave because um, they weren't happy in a, um, you know, in a Trump led Republican Party. But nevertheless, you now have a. Uh, uh, you know, a larger than usual group of Democrats who are thinking about retiring. And anytime you've got um, an open seat in the House, it makes it much easier for the opposing party to try to pick it up. So um, the White House will argue that um, they think that the economic wins are going to be at their back. They think that there will be so much growth this year and next that people will be happy with the job they've done. They think that if they can pass 
um, either this infrastructure plan or the family's plan or both, and they'll be able to demonstrate to the American public that they um, have been able to make government work again and that uh, it's going to be helping uh, Americans um, in their daily lives. But, you know, I still think that it's an uphill battle for Democrats. Um, and that's part of the reason why you see the Biden administration moving so quickly and aggressively to pass these massive pieces of legislation now, because um, as I mentioned, because so many of them worked in the Obama administration, they remember all too well how painful it was when they lost control of the Senate um, only uh, a couple of years after President Obama took office. And then it was sort of shoulda, coulda, woulda, um, all the things that they wished that they had tried to pass when they still had control of the House, the Senate, and the White House. So this administration is definitely front-loading. Yep. Uh, finally, Nancy, uh, we just marked World Press Freedom Day, uh, which was established by the UN as a reminder to governments of the need to respect their commitment to press freedom. Um, this is, of course, one of the freedoms that we enjoy. It's guaranteed in the First Amendment. Um, and, of course, the Freedom Forum is uh, all about our mission is uh, fostering First Amendment freedoms for all. So tell us how the First Amendment and the freedom of the press guides your work on a, on a daily basis. You know, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about how lucky I am to have this incredible platform um, and how great my responsibility is to live up to the trust that is placed in me by our viewers. Um, and that is a, a huge honor and a huge responsibility. Yes, I have the freedom to say uh, just about anything I want, but uh, I have the responsibility to make the most of that freedom. And I have the responsibility to use it to inform people, to choose my words carefully so that I, um, you know, that I'm, I'm not putting any spin on the story one way or the other. I know that our viewers are coming to CBS News because they expect us to be independent, because they expect us to be unbiased and tell the truth. And, um, you know, I know that there is a long legacy of CBS journalists who were great writers, great storytellers, and great truth tellers. And I want to be part of that legacy. And I'm so proud that I am able to, you know, wear the mantle of CBS News, especially at the White House, uh, a place where I've watched so many uh, journalistic greats um, do the work and um, and really hold, uh, hold uh, you know, hold power to account. And so that's what I want to do with my my freedom of speech. And I, I tell you truly, um, on a daily basis, I am just. Uh, so proud that I have the opportunity to do it and also humbled um, and really aware of the responsibility I have to um, to show that the uh, the trust and the faith that the viewers put in me and that um, news executives put in me is not misplaced. Well, Nancy Cordes, Chief White House Correspondent for CBS News, thank you so much for this enlightening conversation and thank you for joining us on First Five Now. Thank you for having me. It's really been an honor. And for our viewers, our next First Five Now is Thursday, May 20th at 2 p.m. when we'll talk with USA Today sports columnist Christine Brennan about the relationship between athletes and activism and how they are using their fame to shine a spotlight on social movements. Uh, this program coincides with the new Freedom Forum exhibit, Fair Play, Athletes Speak, Assemble, Petition for Freedom, which is currently on display at Reagan National and Dulles International Airports. And for, for, for more information on all our programs and initiatives, visit our website at freedomforum.org. I'm John Maynard. Thank you for watching First Five Now.